are not final results. Make sure that what you're hearing is based on official announcements from local and state election officials. Everything else is just noise. Number two, voting in person will be a different experience. You may have always voted at the school or community center down the street, but this year a lot of neighborhood voting sites are being consolidated into larger polling places to keep staff and voters safe. You should get a notification if your polling place has moved, but you can always check at canivote.org. Canivote.org is a nonpartisan site hosted by the National Association of Secretaries of State, which, along with BPC and others, also hosts the Trusted Info 2020 campaign against disinformation. And yes, consolidated polling places and other public health precautions may mean longer lines if you vote in person. Number three, voting by mail will be huge. Because of the pandemic, many states are expanding absentee voting. Even before the pandemic, five states already sent every registered voter a ballot in the mail about three weeks before election day. Another 29 states and the District of Columbia have what's called a no excuse absentee voting system. That means you don't need any reason to vote by mail. You just need to fill out an absentee ballot request form. Many states will mail them to you if you're registered to vote, but if you aren't sure what your state does, go to canivote.org. And even if your state requires a reason for by mail voting, many have expanded those excuses to include concerns about the coronavirus. In many states, you can already request your absentee ballot. Do your part to flatten the curve of absentee voting by requesting and casting your ballot early. Voting in the middle of a pandemic will be unlike anything we've experienced in the past century. But understanding your rights and being prepared ahead of time can help make sure your voice will be heard at the ballot box. Good morning, I'm John Forty. I'm Director of Governmental Studies at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Welcome uh, to all of you to our States of Change event, an annual event that we've been doing here at BPC for four years, uh, but even goes back a couple of years beyond that. Uh, States of Change is a, a, a partnered effort with uh, the Center for American Progress, uh, the Brookings Institution, and the Voter Study Group of the Democracy Fund, and also, I want to mention the, the participation of Carlin Bowman at the American Enterprise Institute. That group uh, has been putting together election information, uh, election information, and, and combined with demographic information, thinking about the future of our electorate. Uh, we each year have uh, new data, uh, a new report. We think, as the name says, about the states, not only our country, but how the states are changing and how they might change over time. And we often have different scenarios as to what might happen if uh, demographics change in one way and voter preferences in another. Just like every year, we have a, an interesting new report. Uh, we're gonna hear from, from the authors of that and walk through that. But we also have a particular theme this year that we're emphasizing. And that is the question of generational change. Uh, we have, now seen uh, Gen Z enter the electorate. Now the, the youngest voters are part of a, a new generation. Uh, all of our generations are moving through the electorate. And what will that portend for politics in the future as these generations age and as our politics shifts because of that? This year's report really tries to look at that uh, aspect, how things are changing, uh, how they might change, and also some of the scenarios, whether voters change their attitudes when they age uh, in, into different parts of life. Uh, how the panel and the, the, pro the event is gonna work today is that we're gonna have a presentation of the report. Now the co-authors of the report are three of our important partners. Um, I'm gonna mention first someone who, uh, Rui Teixeira, who is not able to join us because of some technical difficulties this morning. Uh, Rui, of course, is, has been with us from the beginning and is, is a key uh, player here, uh, a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and the uh, author of a couple of, um, several books, a couple of the more famous ones being The Emerging Democratic Majority and The Disappearing American Voter. Again, Rui, uh, we're sorry you can't join us today, but we're gonna be talking about your work and, and look forward to joining you uh, in, in next year's report. Uh, the other co-authors who are with us, and we'll walk through some of the 
Uh, key findings of that report are Rob Griffin of the voter study group of the Democracy Fund. Uh, Rob is a, a political scientist and he's also been at the at PRRI and CAP uh, working on these sort of demographic issues in the past. Uh, and Bill Fry, who's a senior fellow at Brookings in the Metropolitan Program, uh, who is really one of our nation's leading experts in demography and uh, spent a uh, number of years uh, working on those issues at the University of Michigan as well. Uh, he also has a, a new book, uh, The Diversity Explosion, which, which you can uh, get and we'll add, add more color to what we're gonna hear today. Uh, I'm gonna shortly turn it over to them, but let me also then tell you about the second part of the program briefly, and that is uh, we're going to now with, with Rob uh, in Rui's place, Rob and I are going to uh, have a discussion with two excellent panelists. That's Kristen Soltis Anderson and Tara McGowan. Uh, we'll first hear from the from the about the report. Then we'll have the chance to talk with with Kristen and Tara, and then we'll have time for your questions. Which again, uh, we we hope you'll submit during the the course of the program, and we look forward to speaking with you then. Rob, thanks, John. And good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, you know, I'm I'm here to do just a little bit of introduction work to along with John, just to lay the land for everything. Um, and as John mentioned, <clears throat> this is actually our uh, sixth year of doing this report. Um, and for those of you who have been with us for a long time, uh, thanks for being here. It's nice to see you, even if it's remotely. Um, but for those who are kind of new uh, to the project, I thought I'd just give you sort of a, some, some tips about thinking about the States of Change project and what we're doing. Uh, and if I could have the slides up. So I think there are essentially two things that are really important to take away about States of Change. Again, if this is your first time coming uh, to the project. Um, the first is that really what we're all about is trying to understand the potential impact of demographic change. That there have been changes that have been happening to the country, both in terms of its uh, racial diversity, uh, its educational status, uh, how old it is, the age of the, the electorate. Um, that have been pretty dramatic over the course of the last 40 years. And we expect these changes to continue to happen. So really what we're, what we're trying to do is get a handle on this, to give people a picture of what the future might look like or could various futures could look like. Um, and the second thing that I think is important to take away is that we're not predicting the future. Um, we actually don't like that word here. Um, we like to say that we're simulating the future. Let me draw a line between those two concepts for you. Um, I think when people say that they are predicting the future, what they're walking away with that this is what the authors think, or this is what uh, they, they are sure is going to happen. And we're really never in that position. We're not sure about any one of the various things that we might be talking about today are definitely going to happen. Um, you know, what we are interested in doing is taking some of the popular narratives, the popular ideas about how various demographic change, and as we're going to discuss today, generational change might affect the future, and actually simulating it out. So giving some, some numbers and some bones to some of these ideas that are floating out in the ether. So again, simulating the future, not predicting it, giving people a sense of the contours of the future, what it could look like, um, rather than telling people this is exactly what it's going to, to be. So with that in mind, let's start just diving in. And we'll start with the story you might already know. Um, and this is something that we've covered for the last year, um, essentially just demographic change. How is the country changing demographically? Um, and in short, uh, there's essentially big, three big things that have been happening. Um, the two of them are that the country has becoming uh, has been becoming more racially diverse and it's becoming more educated. And how that plays out, let's say over the next 16 years, uh, is that we're going to see a decline in the number of eligible voters, so those who are 18 and over and citizens of the United States, uh, who are white non-college. They're going to go from 46% in 2016. We expect them to be about 43% of eligible voters uh, today. And then by 2036, down to 34%. This is a really big change, as we'll kind of talk about, and we have talked about in the past. Um, it's just a dramatic uh, shift for a group that has dominated American politics for a really long time, but is in demographic decline. Now, the growing groups are essentially uh, locked in among uh, Latino and Hispanic Americans, as well as those who are Asian and belonging to other racial and ethnic groups. That these groups are going to continue to grow over time. 
White non-college and African Americans, these groups are relatively speaking demographically stable, that we expect them to make up just about the same amount of eligible voters over time going forward into the future. Um, that doesn't mean they're not growing. It doesn't mean they're not uh, changing in size or anything like that. It just means that they're, everybody else is growing too at the same time. So these groups are saying somewhat stable. And as we look at this state by state, um, one of the really important things to understand is how different uh, some of these changes are, are in different parts of the country. So what you're looking at on this slide uh, is all 50 states plus the United States in red. And you're looking at the percent of people in that state among eligible voters who are people of color. Um, so, right, so black, Latino, and Hispanic, uh, people who are Asian and those belonging to other racial and ethnic groups. And what you can see uh, is two things. One, the level of racial diversity in all 50 states actually varies pretty considerably. There's a lot of differences between states. But the two is that they're all moving in the same direction. That is to say, over the next 16 years, we expect just about every state to become more racially diverse. Um, as a result of demographic changes that are happening in the country. And in some places that's going to be bigger, in some places it's going to be smaller. Some places are starting off uh, with a higher level of racial diversity already, and others um, are sort of, you know, uh, catching up. They're, they're sort of much lower on the bar here. But everyone's changing together. Um, this is sort of important. Keep this figure in mind once we look at generational change, because there are some interesting differences. Um, but one of the things we're seeing is that we're seeing each of these states become more diverse, and slowly over time, uh, more and more of them are going to be uh, passing that 50% mark, right, such that they become minority majority states, uh, as people sometimes call them. Now, the other thing that's happening to the country, just to finish off, the third change that's occurring, uh, and sometimes people don't know about this one as much, uh, is actually that the age distribution of the country is getting older. There's more and more Americans who are 65 and over. Um, who are just going to be uh, sort of becoming part of eligible voters over time. A lot of this has to do um, with essentially three phenomena. People are, more people are making it to 65, so people are living a little bit longer there. Once they make it to 65, they're living a little bit longer after that. And then you've also got a big generational bubble uh, that is the baby boomers who are moving into that 65 category. So the number of people who are occupying that very last age group is just increasing over time. It has been for, for some time now. So again, those are the stories you might be more familiar with. It's something that we've covered in the past five years and you know, is relatively um, uh, well discussed within the media. Now, something that people talk about less sometimes, at least the hard numbers of it, is what generational change might look like. That people have a vague sense about, well, some generations are uh, increasing in size, others are declining, but they often don't have a good picture of what that actually looks like in their head. So let's start off with some definitions here. Um, starting with the oldest generation, we've got the silent generation, those born uh, before 1945. Baby boomers born 1946 to 1964. This is a generation that has dominated American politics for a long time. They've been one of the largest generations uh, for a number of decades now. Uh, Gen X born 1965 to 1980. And then the two youngest cohorts, millennials 19, born 1981 to 1996. And then what we're calling for this report, Gen Z+. Plus. Um, now, Gen Z doesn't really have an end point attached to it yet, right? There's, there's no generation that comes after it that's been defined or thought about all that thoroughly yet. Um, so for the purposes of this report, whenever you see us talk about Gen Z, what we're actually going to be talking about is everybody born after 1997. Um, but this still, this just represents sort of the, the earliest and, and, and newest incoming generation uh, that's coming into the, into the fore. Um, and essentially, why we're focusing on generations this year. Uh, there are two big things that we think are important to absorb about this. That is the reason that we focus on them. The first uh, is that these generations have really strong political differences between them, and that we expect these differences to be kind of sticky. I'll talk about so first, as you're looking at in this chart, uh, these are sort of the estimated vote margins for different generations in the 2016 election. As you can see, you've got the silent generation and baby boomers uh, just being notably conservative. So what that value you're looking at there on the X axis, on that horizontal axis, that's the lean of a political uh, of a particular generation. This is if you take the percent who vote for a Democratic candidate and subtract the percent who vote for a, a Democrat or sorry, a Republican candidate. This is sort of the difference between the two. So you've got baby boomers and the silent generation leaning towards the Republican Party. They're the two more conservative-leaning generations. Uh, and then you've got Gen X through Gen Z, 
um, being more liberal leaning, more democratic leaning, but with millennials and Gen Z plus just being notably more democratic leaning, notably more liberal uh, than even Gen X. So again, first things why we focus on generations is there's just big differences between them. The second piece of that puzzle is that we expect them to be sticky. Now, what we mean by that is that the generational leans, right, these, these political affiliations that people have, um, we expect them over time to stay with these generations. Does that mean that they can't shift their vote from election to, election to election? No. People can shift their vote a little bit. We're seeing some of that in 2020, as we might talk about later. Um, does that mean that events can't sort of shift these people's vote around? No, it doesn't mean that. Does it mean they can't potentially, as some people talk about, grow more conservative as they age? No, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean that some of these uh, uh, characteristics might just stick around a little bit, that whatever changes might happen to the future, um, we might, as a start, think about them as coming from this place. It's a change relative to these starting places. And again, especially for Gen Z and millennials, just notably democratic, notably liberal. The other reason that we focus on generations this year is that we think we're at something of a turning point when it comes uh, to sort of a generational story. So what you're looking at here, uh, when what I've graphed, is if you add up the percentage of eligible voters who are Gen Z and millennial, and you chart that over time going into the future, that's that purple line. And if you add up the number of eligible voters who belong to the boom and the silent generation and track that over time, that's that blue line. And in 2020, we are just at the tipping point of those two generations crisscrossing one another. That is to say that just about this year, the number of the, the number of eligible voters who belong to Gen Z and the millennial generation are just about the same size as boomer and silent generation. And again, the boomer generation in particular uh, has dominated American politics. It's been one of the largest generations. It's been one of the most influential for decades. So this is sort of a milestone in terms of understanding some of these generational changes that this, this group that has uh, been a big part of American politics for a long time is really just about to, to meet parity with some of these younger generations that lean in the opposite direction, politically speaking. Now, even more interesting than that in some ways is that we are just one gen or we're one election away from a point when the number of voters, so not just eligible voters, right? Not just people who are 18 and over and citizens, but the number of people who actually show up at the polls uh, and vote, we're just one election away from that same parity point between Gen Z and millennials and boomer and silent uh, voters. So what we're doing in this particular graph is we're taking the 2016 turnout rates that uh, happened for racial and educational and age groups, and we're applying those forward to these groups and going forward into the future. Now, is this what's going to happen precisely? No, it's not what's going to happen precisely, but it's a decent baseline for thinking about the future. It's a way to, to understand what might occur going forward in the future. And essentially, if these groups show up at the same rates they did in 2016, we're looking at just the very connection being the one that's sort of the tipping point between these two, uh, between these groups of generations um, being sort of the dominant group within American politics. Again, with Gen Z and millennials, just in 2024, we're just one election away from being the exact same size as boomer and silent generation. Now, again, think back to that other chart I showed you before, because this is the same type of chart. And again, so this is all 50 states plus the United States in red. Um, and what I'm showing you is the percent of the population of eligible voters in each state as Gen Z and millennial. So in contrast to racial change in the states, um, which, as you saw in that other figure, can be high, it can be low. There's a lot of diversity between states. There's actually far less diversity between states. And the growth patterns are also much more similar between the states. There's some variation, some states being a little bit older, uh, your Maines and your West Virginias and your Floridas. Um, you have some states or dis districts like the District of Columbia, which are notably younger. Um, but by and large, these are actually pretty similar across states and the rates of change going forward into the future are pretty similar. Um, and so I think the big takeaway here is that, you know, to the extent that we think about racial change in the states being important, um, you know, it's caveated by the fact that it's really, it's not occurring in all these, in every state, right? There are just some places that are far less racially diverse. Generational change is a wave that crashes on every shore. It's a change that's coming to every state in the country. So to the extent that we study these things and we think they're important, it's just notable to know um, that this is happening everywhere. It's not just happening in some states, but not others. So 
diving into the electoral simulations. And again, let me reemphasize right up top. These are simulations. These are not predictions about exactly what the future is going to be. Um, these are a discussion of various narratives. They're us putting numbers behind some of the concepts that people have about the future so that we can start to, to chart out, okay, let's take this idea seriously. What does it actually look like? Um, let's take some of you know, what people are saying about what they think about the future, what might happen to millennials or Gen Z, and really put numbers behind it so that we can understand what might be the contours of the future. Again, not predicting it, but simulating. And I'll walk quickly through those four generations, or sorry, those four simulations. So the very first that I'll talk about is going to be uh, what we call the no generational effects uh, simulation. And at heart, what's happening there um, is this is essentially assuming that there are no generational effects. It's a nice baseline for thinking about, okay, what, what does the world look like if we don't take generational effects into account? So we assume essentially that let's take the 2016 turnout rates and support rates for these race, age, education, gender groups on a state-by-state -state basis. And let's just assume they stay uh, constant going forward into the future. So that the only thing that's changing is the graphic composition of the states themselves. Again, growing more racially diverse, getting more educated, becoming older. So this is sort of a baseline to think about um, the, some of these generational models, how it compares to them once we start taking generations into account. The second model does take those generational uh, effects into account. It essentially uh, just says, as a thought experiment, what if generations continue to vote exactly as they did going into the future? So the boomer generation is going to continue to vote as it did. The millennial generation is going to vote it is did, as, as it did. Gen Z is going to vote it, as it did in 2016. Um, but we're just going to assume stability in those generational preferences going forward into the future. And again, is this absolutely the truth? Is it absolutely what's going to happen? No, probably not. But again, it's a thought experiment about what happens if we do take those generational cohorts, partisan lean, kind of seriously and think that they might extend forward going into the future. The third simulation these generational effects decline with age, is what we assume is that uh, generations, as some people uh, have hypothesized, become more conservative as they age. So we're gonna essentially assume here that all of these generations are gonna continue to become more conservative and lean more Republican uh, going forward into the future. So we start off with their 2016 support rates, right? so how they voted in the 2016 election, and then cycle over cycle, they're just gonna become a little more conservative as they age into the electorate. And then we finally have uh, the fourth scenario, um, which essentially is what if generations kind of stay the same, but what if there is a post-millennial generation that becomes more conservative? Because even right now, Gen Z is in the electorate, but it's not really that large. And we don't necessarily know everything in the world about those people who are under 18, who belong to that generation still. Some people have hypothesized that this generation might come in more conservative at some point. So we, again, explore this with this fourth scenario. And as I'll talk through these, um, I'll do this through a series of charts. Um, on the very left, that left chart, what you're looking is at the Democratic popular vote margin. So this is the percent of the vote uh, at a national level um, that is going to the Democratic candidates under the assumptions of these various simulations. So positive values there, values above that zero line are wins for the Democratic Party and the popular vote. Uh, values below that red zero line are wins for the Republican Party. And on the right graph are the number of Democratic Electoral College votes, um, the red line at 270. So um, given you know, uh, a Democratic win, it would be above that line um, going forward into the future. And below that line would be a Republican win um, in that, again, given year and given uh, simulation. And so the very first uh, scenario that we play out is once again, this, uh, this no generational effect simulation. And compared to 2016, what we see is that the Democratic margin is even larger than it was in 2016 on the basis of just demographic change. That is, again, the country is becoming more racially diverse, it's becoming more educated, and it's coming a bit older. And even in 2020, we would expect the vote margin to go up for a Democratic candidate given these demographic changes. So at a popular vote, again, Hillary Clinton won by about two points. Uh, we have a Democratic candidate here coming in just below five, so roundabouts of four points, maybe a little bit north of that. Among the Electoral College, what we would actually see is if we played this out in the states, that is to say, if we take all these demographic, uh, demographic changes and we play them out state by state, 
it would actually result in an electoral college tie. So if we were in a world where nothing was changing about people's voting behavior, it was just the demographics that were uh, happening in the future, um, we would expect even that to move the electoral college to a 269 to 269 um, scenario, a tie essentially in the electoral college, um, on the basis of that demographic change alone. Um, and that, you know, again, compared to the 2016, this was an improvement for Democrats, but still not necessarily a win. And then as we go through those future, those demographic changes just continue to kick in. Um, that cycle over cycle gets there for Republicans in all of these states and starts adding up to a larger and larger uh, Democratic vote share, even under the assumption that nobody really changes their voting behavior, that all these demographic groups essentially vote the same. Our next simulation and this is sort of the high water mark for the Democratic Party, is what happens uh, if there is a large amount or if there are generational effects. So what happens if millennials do continue to vote like millennials did in 2016? What happens if Gen Z does continue to vote as it did in 2016? And same for all the other generations. What we see is that there is a marked improvement in the Democratic vote share for, for the Democratic Party, um, that they're winning by even more, that if you start to incorporate any of these ideas about generations holding on to their various political preferences, um, we're actually just seeing the Democratic Party uh, start to gain more and more vote share over time. Going up to 2036, this starts to top out close to uh, over 400 uh, point win in the electoral college. So it starts to look like a blowout within just a couple of election cycles if nothing changed about these generations. And again, this is not a prediction saying this is exactly what's going to happen. But if you do take the idea of generations seriously, and if you thought the idea that generations are just going to stay the same as they age, this is what it would look like. And one of the features driving this under the hood that's worth noticing, again, this is this, that vote margin, that Democratic versus Republican vote margin um, on the y-axis. And then for each of the age categories here, I've plotted essentially how uh, their vote margin is changing over time as a result of, uh, in either this age-based simulation, which again was that first simulation, or the generations-based simulation, which is that second simulation. And what you can see is that the one of the reasons this is happening um, within this generation-based simulation is just that there is this sort of rapid uh, uh, becoming, there's a rapid pace at which some of these older age groups, those 45 to 64, those 30 to 44, are becoming more democratic as more and more Gen Z and millennials start to populate those particular age groups. The only real group that doesn't change too much is those 65 and up. Um, so these are, again, this is just how this is working under the hood, is that, that different generations can age into the electorate. They're just making these different age groups much more democratic leaning over time, uh, compared to a model where we just assume that the racial and educational composition of these groups shifts over time. Our third simulation right here in orange uh, is that these generations become more conservative as they age. So again, we're taking into account these generational effects, but we're also allowing for the idea that they become more conservative as they age. So this is kind of threading the needle between those two first simulations, that between just that age-based simulation, which again, just assumes demographic change is going to occur, but nobody's voting behavior changes. Um, this is more democratic leaning than that, but less democratic leaning uh, than a scenario where uh, just Gen Z are not a full bore, you know, Gen Z and millennials are continuing unchanged into the future. So in the popular vote margin, again, this looks like it's threading the needle between the two. But in the electoral college, this is actually much closer to looking like a full generational effect model than it is an age-based model that even at trying to account for some of these changes over time as people potentially become more conservative as they age, um, it, it really doesn't make as big of a difference in the electoral college once we try to simulate this out. Um, it's just sort of, again, something that threads the needle between the two, but doesn't have nearly the size of the effect that some people, I think, might imagine. And then we have a fourth scenario where, again, this is uh, the scenario where post-millennial generations come in uh, just a bit more uh, conservative than they are right now. So what we're essentially assuming is one Z, the part of it that's not in the electorate yet, the part of it that's yet to come, just is more conservative, generally speaking, uh, than the millennial generation. That they're, they're, you know, we'll take them at their baseline, but assume that there's a big shift uh, towards making them more conservative. Again, this kind of splits the, the, the difference between our full generational model and our no generational model. 
Um, it doesn't look that different in terms of the popular vote from the, uh, the generations get more conservative as they age scenario. But in the Electoral College, it does start to play out just slightly differently, particularly in 2028, that these look pretty similar in 2020 and 2024. But there's a divergence between those orange and green lines on that right side of the chart uh, once we get out to 2028. But again, as we move forward into the future, some of these differences once again disappear as we think about the Electoral College. So just to sum up, I think what a lot of these models are telling us, even these models that people put forward to say like, well, maybe generational change will not be as powerful as we think it'll be, is that even trying to account for these, it, it's, it's hard to imagine these, these just these simulations, these scenarios that we've made, these assumptions, it's really not enough uh, to push the, the, the ball sort of towards the Republican Party all that much, that de both demographic change and uh, these generational models are sort of winds blowing in the same direction and creating a headwind for the Republican Party and advantages for the Democratic Party as we go forward into the future. Um, and with that, I will hand it over uh, to Bill Fry, who will give us the story in the States. Well, thank you very much, Rob. And a uh, shout out to Rui Teixeira, who I know is here with us in spirit, even though the technolo techno technology go gods did not allow him to connect today. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a story in the States. And essentially what I'm going to do is translate a lot of these charts that Rob just talked about into the specific um, situations for, for states that are involved with the changing electoral vote composition over time. It's this kind of jigsaw puzzle of states. Uh, that move in different directions as a result of our different simulations over time. Uh, but one thing I want to say right off the bat and emphasize what Rob talked about is that uh, our projections assume, of course, that younger people who are more racially diverse, more educated as they grow older, the rest of the population becomes more racially diverse and more educated. But an another piece of our story is that states also change in their demographic makeup over time. Uh, and in that case, uh, you know, we start out with states that are very racially diverse, but over time that moves to different parts of the country and the ones who are racially diverse now become more racially diverse. So, for example, nationally, about a third of eligible voters in 2020 are people of color. We move to the year 2036 and 41% of eligible voters are people of color. But in Arizona, in 2020, 38% of people are people of color, and that moves up to 48% in the year 2036. In Texas, it goes from 50% in 2020 to 60% in 2036. So you see different states move in different directions, and even as Rob showed in that first chart there, even largely white states are uh, becoming more diverse over time. Now, that, that builds into our projections. Uh, you know, our projections are fairly sophisticated if we have to pat ourselves on the back a little bit. We do a cohort component methodology showing how different generations age over time. We add in survival rates for mortality. Uh, we add in birth rates and then also people who become citizens age 18 and over, and then immigration as well. That's, that's, that's just the piece of it. But in addition, we also make projections at the state level, and that means in addition to all of that, we have immigration partialed out to the difference projected over time. And also migration flows from each state to the rest of the country, again, by these age and race and education attributes uh, put out over time. So this is, this is a fairly high profile, high, highly technical demographic projection on which we then talk about different preferences. So all of our different models have the same underlying demographic shifts over time by states and age and so on about how people vote. So uh, I want to talk first about 11 states that we see are the kind of swing states that move from red to blue under our different kinds of models. I mean, some of them are very uh, familiar to you. So Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Rust Belt, and then in the South, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and then Arizona in the West. And we also add in Iowa and Texas and Ohio and Alaska, who knew? Alaska we have in there as well as one of our states. So let's move to the next slide here. And what the next slide shows us, this is the model, uh, a simulation that shows uh, between starting with 2016, but then the simulation goes from 2020 to 36. You see there going from uh, the top to the bottom there on the left. 
uh, how these 11 states may or may not move to the Democrat, Democratic column in each of these uh, presidential elections going forward, which translate into those electoral college votes we just saw that Rob talked about. In this particular model, this is the no generational effects model, which of course, as Rob said, means we're not assuming that generations carry with them whatever their current Republican or Democratic preference over time, but rather we, they, we keep every age group's race, age groups, uh, Republican or demographic preference, uh, the same going forward. So it's kind of a simple way to say it is uh, millennials are going to vote like their parents <laughs> all, all the way through. Uh, it's not exactly right, but it gives you the kind of general idea. So keeping, keeping no generational effects and just changing the underlying demography, but not making any kind of effects with respect to voter preference. We see that between 2016 and 2020, as Rob showed, uh, the Democrats actually do uh, pick off two states, Michigan and Pennsylvania, two of those big three Midwestern states. Now, when you translate it, that into electoral college votes, it actually splits down the middle. Instead of the Republicans winning like they did in 2016 by 306 to 232 in, 20, in uh, 2020, according to this particular simulation, it's tied. 269 to 269 ah, goes into the House of Representatives to figure out what's going on there. Now, if we move the demography ahead to 2024, we now move Wisconsin and Florida into the Democratic column. And by then, with the same demography, but different voting, uh, with the same demography, with the demography changing uh, and the same voting preferences, we now have the Democrats picking up 306 electoral votes, the same number of electoral votes that Republican had, Republicans had in 2016. The only thing that's changed is the underlying demography, not the voting preferences. And as we move further into 2028, we see Georgia and North Carolina going into the Democratic column. And in 2032, uh, we have Arizona moving into the Democratic column. And by 2036, you know, seven of our 11 states have moved uh, from the total Republican column in 2016 up to the Democratic column in 2036. And as I said, this doesn't make any assumptions about having generations follow their own preferences over time. Uh, this is just simply a baseline model that shows if demography keeps winding on the way it is and the voting preferences stay the way they were in 2016, the Democrats come out ahead in pretty big numbers. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and this slide takes in the full generational effects. This is like the other extreme. And here, as Rob mentioned, we make the assumption that all the generational voting patterns in 2016 stay with those generations as they age over time, especially those strong democratic preferences for millennials and Gen Zers. And, uh, you know, of course, that moves ahead in, into states that are very diverse, and especially their young people are very diverse, and that has a big impact on what's going on. So if you look at 2020 here, you not only have Michigan and Pennsylvania moving into the demographic Democratic column, but also Wisconsin and Florida and Arizona. In that first model that we just looked at, Arizona doesn't get into the Democratic Democratic column in 20, until 2032. But here in 2020, according to this model, this model would say if this all held up uh, two weeks from tomorrow, we'd have five states here, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Florida, and Arizona moving in the Democratic column. And then in 2024, we add Georgia and North Carolina. And then in 2028, nine of the 11 states, including Texas, just eight years from now, nine of the 11 states uh, will be in the Democratic column. And by 2036, we have all of them in there, including Alaska. So this is what happens when we have this full generational forward model uh, with all these young people retaining uh, their, uh, their preferences going forward. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, and the next slide is uh, generational effects decline with age, or the people become more conservative, somewhat more conservative as they, as they move to age. Again, we start in 2016 with all these states voting Republican. In 2020, it's not quite as strongly Democrat as in the full in the, in the, in the full generation model, but we still have Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Florida, enough to give the Democrats a healthy win. And uh, by 2024, we add Arizona into that. Uh, as well as North Carolina, and continue to move in that direction. Uh, even in 2036, Alaska still stays in the Republican column, and in 20, 2032, Iowa and Alaska stay in the Republican column. But still, even this generational model with some conservative uh, movement as people age 
shows a strong, Demo strong Democratic uh, uh, result in, in all of these elections. So let's go to yet another model in the next slide. And this is a slide that says post-millennial generations become more conservative. This is the idea is, well, you can't stay this liberal. I mean, maybe the next generation is going to be a little bit more conservative, the Gen Zers and the people uh, beyond Gen Zers. Uh, but of course, their impacts are going to be a little more delayed. Uh, we won't see them right away. And sure enough, in 2020, we have the same result with this model as we did with the previous model. And it, although the Democrats still, uh, still come out ahead in 2024, once again, Arizona, North Carolina joined the ranks uh, of the Democrats. And then in 2020, still more states come along. It's a little bit more lagged for some states. Texas only joins the Democratic column in 2032, according to this model, rather than in 2028, according to the previous models. But it still becomes very demo democratically oriented, uh, with the Democrats getting between 308 electoral votes in 2020 to 408 electoral votes in 2036, because they're able to capture uh, the lion's share of these states. So, you know, what does this all mean? I mean, I think you look at this and say, gee, uh, the 2020 election, according to any of these models, will either be split between Republican and Democratic seats uh, if there is no generational effects. But for any of the generational effects kick in, even between 2016 and 2020, those generational effects could generate several more states for the Democrats. And then if you move ahead to several uh, presidential elections, especially the 2028, when a, when a good share of those states move into the Democratic column, you see that this is kind of an important impact uh, and, and a windfall, really, for the Democratic Party. So, uh, you know, you can look at it this way, but as Rob says, these are uh, simulations, they're projections, and they're not predictions. They're based on assumptions uh, that we make about all kinds of things and uh, certainly cannot necessarily be what we're going to find out. Uh, there are lots of other things getting into the picture. But I would say, again, we have a very sophisticated demo demographic, demographic model in the sense that not only do we take in actual voting patterns for which we make sort of assumptions about how they change, but we tie them to the real demographic structure of the country in terms of a cohort component model that takes into age, race, education, immigration, and migration across states over time. This is something we, we want to thank our funders for giving us the resources to be able to do this because I think it gives a very clear picture of where we can go in the future. Um, you know, there are a lot of people will say that this genera these generational models may not work. Uh, and of course, they are assumptions. They might say, you know, there are baby boomers who were voting for George McGovern in 1972 and then later became Reagan Democrats and later became Republicans after that. And it's certainly true there may be changes over time in all of this. But I would say, as Rob mentioned, uh, these younger generations are very distinct demographically. Uh, we already have more than 40 percent of millennials and Gen Zers who are people of color, and about 20 percent of those are Latinos. A much bigger share of all of those groups have college educations and of whites have college educations than they did in the past. So fundamentally, that demographic structure is quite different than a lot of the generations that are older and that have been, you know, sort of accounting for our uh, demographic results and our political results in the last couple of elections. So I would say, you know, I wouldn't go out and bet a lot of money on the Democratic Party winning all these elections in the future necessarily, but I would say that both parties need to pay attention to these younger generations, to pay attention to their issues and how they vote. And, uh, you know, if things stayed the same as they are now, then it would be difficult for the Republicans to take over. But I think both parties are interested in getting as many voters as they can and will pay attention to this underlying demographic structure. Demography does not determine destiny, but it certainly shapes it in a big way. So with that, let's go to the panel. Thank you, Bill. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're going to transition to the second panel. Again, Rui Teixeira, we are missing you because of uh, technology issues, but Rob Griffin is going to join me in moderating the second uh, session. Let me remind you also that as this panel uh, goes forward, we're going to want to hear from you from some questions. So we, we know that you can uh, submit questions on YouTube through the chat function or on Twitter at the hashtag VPC Live. So look forward to your questions at the end. But I want to uh, kick off this panel by introducing our two really um, expert uh, panelists. Uh, typically, we have 
panelists, uh, people who comment on our, our work, uh, both uh, coming from one, coming from the more Republican side, one more from the Democratic side. And also, we really do like to have people who are uh, know the real world of politics, but are also very familiar with the data and, and able to uh, think about this in an analytic way. And I, I can't imagine two panelists that are, that are more like that than the two we have today. Uh, Kristen Soltis Anderson uh, is the co-founder and, and partner at Echelon Insights. Uh, it's a firm that works more on the Republican side and, and polling and data analytics. Uh, and a, a Fox contributor, as well as the host of What Are the Odds? Uh, used to used to co-host The Pollsters, a great podcast. Uh, and just for this panel, especially of interest, uh, the author of a book, The Selfie Vote. That was 2015. So interested to talk to Kristen uh, about that book and also how things have changed in those, those few years since then. Uh, also with us, Tara McGowan, who is the founder and CEO of Acronym, uh, a firm works more on the progressive side in politics with candidates and groups, and again, uh, with, with data analytics and, and uh, polling as well. Uh, she previously held several positions, including the Director of Digital Strategy at Priorities USA Action. Uh, so let me begin. Um, let me turn to you, Kristen. I mentioned your book, uh, The Selfie Vote. That is uh, 2015, maybe a, a, almost a generation ago, or, or I might joke a generation ago in the sense that Literally, you were talking about the millennial generation and Gen Z hadn't quite made it into the electorate yet. Um, tell us a little bit about what you were thinking about in that book, how things have changed in the, in the time, and also what, what you saw in the presentation that, that struck you from, from your work in the field. Sure. Thank you, John. And, and thank you to all of the, the researchers that worked on this project. Uh, I was absolutely delighted as I began reading through the report and saw in the introduction a number of things that I thought, I have been preaching this for years, someone else is now saying it, I'm so excited. Uh, you know, about a decade ago, I really got interested in studying the topic of younger voters, because as someone who is younger and right of center, I was both enthusiastic and excited to see so many people in my generation getting engaged in politics during uh, Obama's presidency, but was also concerned because so many of my peers who had previously not been interested in politics at all, were now going, well, Kristen, how can you be a Republican? You seem so nice and normal. Uh, and this caused me to be a little concerned. Okay, well, what's going on that's making so many people in my generation so turned off from, from the GOP? Uh, and maybe this is just normal. You know, as, as was noted, many people believe that when you're young, you're, con you're progressive and you become as you get older. So maybe this is just normal. Maybe I'm the weird one. Uh, and so I began doing research, and by the time I got to 2015 and the selfie vote came out, I had really done a lot of data that suggested, no, it's not always the case that younger voters are significantly more progressive than their grandparents, that we've had a number of elections in recent uh, decades that as recently as the year 2000, George Bush versus Al Gore, there's almost no generational divide in that election. So it's not always the case that there are big generational cleavages in, in our politics. Um, and so this, from my view, was a big, uh, needed to send up alarms for Republicans. That this idea that all of these millennials were going to get older and they were going to get married and buy homes and pay taxes and suddenly become Republicans just didn't seem backed up by uh, the data for me. Uh, and so when I wrote the selfie vote, the selfie vote basically makes the case that Republicans need to focus more on young people. They need to focus more on um, how they talk about issues like immigration, having more issues like climate. Uh, they're going to have problems voters without different positions on LGBT issues. Those are the sorts of things I raised in the selfie vote. But interestingly, there's one word that does not appear in the selfie vote, and that's the word Trump. My book came out in 2015, sort of just before the Trump phenomenon in the Republican primary began. Um, and so what was interesting was at the time that the selfie vote came out, Republicans seemed somewhat receptive to this message that they needed to focus on young voters, that they might be doomed over a long enough time horizon if they don't. And then Trump won. And when you are victorious, you tend to go, well, wait a minute, maybe we got something right. Maybe all these people saying that we were doomed were wrong. Um, and so I think the, the argument that Republicans needed to do more to focus on young voters somewhat fell out of fashion or, you know, Trump sort of gaining 
uh, you know, enthusiasm from a select group of college conservatives who are really good at using memes has convinced a lot of Republican strategists, oh, look, even Trump is really good with young voters. But the data just don't don't bear it out. And so I was I was glad to see this report come together because it for me, just reaffirms that all the things I was thinking were the case in 2015 have not changed, even as a result of, you know, Republicans winning the White House in 2016. There were a couple of things, though, that, that I do think stick out to me, and I'm, I am loath to criticize or nitpick anything because uh, I'm so glad that the overall message is out there and uh, hopefully is sending a warning sign to Republicans. They do need to focus millennials and Gen Zers. But there are a couple things that I think are just very hard to factor into any simulation. One is that candidates matter. Um, there's a reason why Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden are polling very among senior citizens this time around. So looking at the other end of the generational divide, um, it's fascinating that this time around, you actually don't see voters being progressive and going for Republicans. You see in many states, Joe Biden doing quite well with Republicans, or pardon me, with senior citizens. So there are some limits to this where candidate quality and message and the issue environment play a huge role. And so I've become a bit more humble about what can we know in the medium to long term in our politics, given those factors. Um, I think the other thing that strikes me is that this assumes party coalitions stay stable in some way, that things don't happen that push some groups in while driving other group, uh, dri draw some groups in while pushing others away. Um, so you can imagine a scenario where this influx of Gen Z and millennials as a, a ever more crucial voting group in the Democratic Party pushes them toward more and more progressive policies. And that leads to a sort of corresponding backlash for some folks that in this election might be quite open to voting for Joe Biden would be less interested in voting for a Democratic nominee, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So those are my two sort of nitpicks, is that candidates matter and party coalitions are always changing. And that, I think, inhibits our ability to know long-term happen. But I still think there are a ton of blinking sirens here in this report um, that Republicans need to listen to to further emphasize why it matters to reach out to young voters today to make it um, in their ability to win elections tomorrow. So, so Tara, um, you know, when we do these reports, usually we have a lot of scenarios and uh, we try to do a range of them showing where Republicans might do better and Democrats might do better. I, I, I did feel that this report is probably the, the most pessimistic for Republicans if thinking about the generations and how much they've moved left of center, the younger generations and thinking about how they move through the, the, the electorate. So your thoughts generally about how you see that from the more progressive side, uh, but also maybe some counter thoughts. Are, are there things that keep you up at night? Uh, are there things that you see in, in uh, voters moving that, that there is evidence that as they vote, uh, as they age or have life events, that perhaps they move away from some of those, those, uh, those pre-held views? What are your thoughts about that? The report, just uh, what's on your mind? Thanks, John, and thanks for having me, and thanks to everybody who put this amazing report together. Um, so I, uh, I, I, it's very uh, difficult because I'm a communication strategist working very closely on the 2020 election. This has been a refreshing exercise to zoom out um, and look at and look at the trends and 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 really take a step back from this really really unique and unprecedented election, where I really do think we're going to see um, a lot of shifts in terms of the electorate and the vote, um, both in terms of turnout and uh, and the the party affiliation uh, in terms of who they vote for in this presidential election. But I have to, when looking at this report and looking at this data, um, I agree with Kristen on a lot of her points. Um, I think that uh, this raises extraordinary alarm bells for the Republican Party that were raised and acknowledged after the 2012 election when President Obama uh, beat Mitt Romney um, in that election where there was, um, it felt like a lot of reflection uh, in the Republican Party uh, around that the fact that they needed to make more inroads and do more outreach to younger generations as well as more diverse coalitions of voters um, and, uh, and less white voters, um, frankly, uh, across the country. And so that is, that is something that uh, I think that the party uh, intended to do until uh, Trump 
became the the nominee in the 2016 election and of course has really shifted the party farther uh, to the right um, uh, through the course of this administration. And so I think what's really interesting too uh, is that we're already seeing um, these changes play out right now, um, that this, that these uh, predictions or not predictions, but simulations point to in the respective um, of, of where where voters are when it comes to the issues and also and also just their affiliation with parties. I think Kristen made a really good point that this does not take into account um, uh, shifts within the parties themselves and party coalitions. And, and of course, we're seeing that happen within both parties separate from this election um, and and that there there are movements farther to the left within the Democratic coalition and base and movements, of course, as Trump has shown further to the right in Republican base. And so it's really going to be critical that both both parties moving forward in the future um, really understand where these younger coalitions of voters are and how their generations are um, are behaving in terms of their politics and their their behavior when it comes to voting. I think that we're going to see an enormous shift in terms of um, record breaking turnout among younger voters um, this this November, and that will ultimately also shift the electorate because the younger you are when you first vote or register to vote or engage in an election, the more likely you are to vote. Um, for the rest of your life in presidential or other elections. And so that will also have an impact. Um, and, and I certainly think that um, the, the generational data from this, from this report is really important that you know, our, our generation, I'm a millennial, I'm 34, um, and, and the generations beneath us, they are uh, getting married later in life if they're getting married at all. Um, they are, uh, they're starting, their, their, their relationship to um, the job force and the economy is very different. We have been through uh, recessions. We're going to go through another one, it seems. And so our relationship to the economy and, and government and institutions is also different. And I think that's an important piece too, is that um, we, I really do believe that younger coalitions are going to shift the parties increasingly and our understanding of politics and how these parties respond. Uh, they wanna see solutions, they don't wanna hear uh, fights around whether climate change is real or not. Um, younger uh, generations believe uh, the science and they believe that it is and they want to see action on it. Um, they also have very different relationships to social issues and 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 relationships and understanding um, their experiences are very different and that colors their politics. So what I think has been really disheartening to see with Trump at the head of the Republican Party and the Republican Party really double down around Trump and Trumpism is that uh, because they see the forest through the trees here in terms of these coalitions and the electorate, um, they instead have doubled down on issues like voter suppression um, and 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 deterrence of uh, non-white voters and younger voters, as opposed to figuring out ways to really reach out to them and embrace them and represent uh, where these coalitions are politically. And I think that's something that is not sustainable for the Republican Party if they ever want to be in power um, again beyond this election. So I'm going to ask Rob if he has some questions. Uh, but first, let me remind you as a viewer, if you'd like to ask a question on YouTube, you can do through, so through the chat function or on Twitter with our hashtag VPC Live. Rob? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, you know, I think I think question for Kristen, because um, I know obviously with your book, you, you've thought about this a lot. Um, you know, one of the scenarios we play out that I'm actually quite sympathetic towards is generations get more conservative as they get older, right? And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the caveats might look like to that sort of assumption, right? Because I, I think just to tag several things, right? We have an earlier generations here that are much more racially diverse. So maybe that going more conservative they age phenomena does not quite translate to these younger generations given their racial diversity. They're also more educated. So maybe it doesn't translate in the same way because of that. Um, and I think there's another piece of the puzzle, which is almost what, what Tara is mentioning, um, is that you also have generations that, because of changes in society, because of two now kind of economic recessions, might have certain uh, landmarks of adulthood um, just delayed, or maybe they don't happen at all. And those being childbearing and sort of home ownership, which people often think about as conservatizing types of behaviors. And just kind of kind of thinking through, um, you know, again, being sympathetic from my end that these things are actually that could occur. And even might likely occur. What's the other edge of the of the sword there, if you know what I mean? Like, how how are the ways in which this might just not apply to these generations? Yeah. So I, I mean, I think this is this is something that I have to answer a, a lot because it's very ingrained, especially in conservative circles. In part because the experience of the baby boomers 
was to be quite progressive. They remember their, you know, kind of hippie days and protesting against Vietnam got older and they went through the Reagan and Clinton eras and they came out the other side being a bit more conservative. And there's this assumption that, oh, it happened to me. So it's probably happening to these younger generations. Um, and I think we have enough data at this point that shows at least for the millennials that this idea that they're gonna get more conservative as they age just hasn't been panning out. You can look, for instance, at how that very first kind of tip of the spiels, uh, the very oldest, how they voted in the 2006 midterm. It's the first midterm millennials really had a, a role in. Um, and in that midterm, they broke for Democratic candidates by huge margins. It was bigger than any single age group had broken for any particular party going back I think through any exit poll finding I could find going back you know, through decades. And yet when we look at the 2018 midterms, millennials are now no longer 18 to 24 year olds. They are now the 30 year olds. And they were voting the same way that they did in 2006, breaking enormously for Democratic candidates. Now, as I mentioned, these things are not static. Uh, there have been elections in the intervening 14 years where there have been moments where millennials were a little more evenly divided. But I just think at this point, you can't say, you know, a lot of people are relying on this idea that millennials are all, you know, the kids that just graduated from college yesterday. And it's like, no, no, millennials are now, they're about to begin having 40th birthday parties. They're not children anymore. Uh, they're not even close. And yet we still see pretty deeply progressive views. Now, one thing that, that gives me some pause is I actually wonder if for the millennials, we wind up with our political views still being somewhat centrist. Um, actually, I did a, a report recently for the Walton Family Foundation about Gen Z and millennials and their views of things like the American dream, et cetera. And we actually found a pretty good amount of optimism um, that two thirds of millennials and Gen Zers feel they can access the American dream. That number was even across racial and ethnic lines. So the idea that if there is still this optimism, if Republicans can come around to embracing a more optimistic view, a more future looking view, that that might put them more in sync with where young people are. And you could see them moving to the right, but that would be because of a shift in the party, less so than a shift in the voters themselves. So you have to disentangle those two things. What's also interesting that we found in that Walton project was we asked millennials and Gen Zers to describe their generations in a, in a word or two. And for millennials, it tended to be things like adaptive, practical, um, pr you know, pragmatic. That we faced a lot. We grew up in the shadow of 9-11, financial crises, you know, you name it, we've experienced it. And we've just had to adapt and be very resilient as a generation. Um, where for the Gen Zers, they're like, no, we're not here to adapt. We're here to raise our voices and make change and demand the world we want to see. And that that also may foster a more argumentative and combative politics. And it may also make more space for uh, folks further out on the ideological edges. And that could include um, uh, conservatives. Um, you know, the idea that you could have a pocket within Generation Z that is actually quite conservative, more conservative than you really find even among Republican millennials, is something that I am quite open to the possibility of. Though I think in the end, it does not fully counteract these broader wins that we are seeing, younger generations being much more progressive. The last thing I would note is, I think the definitions, not only just of what Republican and Democrat are, but what progressive and conservative mean also change. Um, and so it is possible you know, that there are things that, if I consider myself conservative, there are things that I believe and hold true that would have horrified someone who considered themselves conservative in 1990. That word means something different to me than it might have meant to someone at the beginning of Reagan's presidency. And so these terms are also changing, which I think is important to keep in mind. So maybe I can ask uh, Tara, but, but if, if Kristen wants to weigh in on this too, um, this seemed to come on quickly. Uh, we mentioned before that there wasn't always a great uh, divide between the generations. and where you want to date it, but certainly in the, the 2004, 2006 range, we started to see big differences in the way that younger people voted, much more progressive. Um, some of that obviously can be explained as a demographics, a more diverse generation, but that didn't happen overnight. That's, that happened over time. So you know, what, what was it that, was there, was there a moment or, a, or several moments that really changed the, dem uh, the generations? I mean, some people talk about the war, uh, the, the Iraq war or the financial crisis, that's a little bit later. Um, there was 9-11, of course, on the other side of that. So why why the sudden change? And then, of course, it seems to be lasting that the, the generations since then seem to be significantly more progressive. 
Sure. I think Kristen um, did touch on this a little bit. I mean, I, millennials are the generation that came of age in 9-11. Um, I personally was 15 years old during that, and that really shaped and colored our experiences and understanding of politics um, and, and, and political parties and the role um, of governments in, in terms of how they respond to, to crises and our foreign relations and relationships. And so, um, and then from there, of course, the economic recession and, and how that impacted um, younger generations' abilities to get job and enter the workforce later and later, um, uh, which of course then delays everything else, starting a family, buying a home, as you mentioned, I think that matters. I also think um, we are living in a time of incredible disruption in terms of technology and, and the environment um, beyond just our politics. And that is something that um, younger generations are, are, are experiencing the impacts of not just hearing theoretically um, what, these, what these events could look like and how government should maybe approach them, they're happening in real time. And um, I, I find that uh, millennials and Gen Z voters in particular, they just have less patience or tolerance um, uh, for for the, the partisan fighting over um, issues and matters of science like climate change. Also, uh, younger generations have grown up with mass shootings in their schools, their relationship um, to, to, to violence and gun violence and gun reform and also seeing, um, as we've seen with the incredible movement of March for Our Lives after, um, uh, after the shootings in 2018 um, were uh, in, in Parkland, Florida, were that they were fed up that the majority of Americans wanted to see action um, on, on gun control and gun violence in this country, and yet it was blocked um, uh, by our government and by a Republican majority in the Senate. And so there's also, I feel like, an increasing understanding by younger generations that um, that politics matter, uh, who you elect matters, and how you hold elected officials accountable once they're in office matter. Um, and because of the gridlock that our generation and younger generations have seen in our federal government, in our Congress, in our Senate, I think that there is also um, an increased energy to be able to, to change that. And yet the risk also on the other side of that is that the, 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 the increasing mistrust in our institutions or in our government or elected officials to be able to actually represent the electorate. And I think that will, um, will also influence this other topic we've been talking about, about how the parties adapt and change to meet voters where they are, especially as they become younger and more diverse um, as, as the electorate ages. And so I think that's going to be really the test for both of the parties is to how to actually not just get elected um, in presidential or other down ballot elections, but to meaningfully represent the demands and the will of the majority of voters, especially as they lean more progressive. And if if those voters do not see um, their elected officials actually um, advance meaningful progress and change, there could be a backlash, whether that's divisions within the own party, the creation potentially of other parties or movements, um, uh, or movement to a different party. So I do believe that this is a really um, uh, tenuous and 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 fragile uh, sort of ecosystem. And I do think that it's really important that the Democratic Party in particular double down and make sure that they don't take any of these voting blocks for granted, whether those are Black voters, Latinx voters, or younger voters, um, because they have reliably voted Democrat, and they really need to show up and actually achieve the progress that these voters are looking for and voting for them to do in order to also hold that advantage that we're talking about. Great. Now, Rob, maybe you have one more question before we're going to turn it to uh, the audience. And again, just to remind the audience that uh, you can submit questions on YouTube via the chat function and Twitter with the, with the hashtag BPC Live. So, Rob, do uh, you have a last question for Tara and Kristen before we move to the audience? Sure. I'll, I'll just put one out there. And I think you've both spoken to it a little bit. But, um, you know, if you had to, given what you know, I think, about the, the values that are resting underneath uh, some of the, the voting choices that we're seeing among these generations, what does what a political entrepreneur, right, a, a politician that holds on to these voters look like? And again, I think both for the a future Republican candidate and a future Democratic candidate. I'll take it from the Republican angle. I think for a future Republican candidate, I have always been intrigued by what I sort of jokingly call like Arthur Brooksism, which is almost like compassionate conservatism 2.0. Um, but I think with, with some critical differences, you know, th this also sort of answers John's previous question, which was what was the thing that caused this big generational break to happen? And what I find was a big factor in all of this is that you had three things all happen within pretty rapid succession. 
you had the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan going very south, very publicly, very quickly. Um, you had the Obama as a very powerful political figure, ultimately president, um, and you had the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. And I think these three things have left millennials with a more um, less uh, interested in projecting American military fraud, which was a big piece of the Republican puzzle um, up until that point, uh, and a, a skepticism of the idea that free markets are good and that government and big government are inherently bad. Um, one of the numbers that to most uh, you know, eye-opening as I was beginning my research some years ago was Pew Research Center has asked for a long time, do you believe that government tends to be inefficient and wasteful, or do you believe that government is good at solving problems? I'm probably butchering the exact wording of the question, but it was basically a barometer of, would you prefer, do you think big government is, is a bad thing, or do you think that actually government is, it ought to be leveraged to solve problems? And that there had used to not, there had been some generation gaps around there, but that the generation gap on that question really became and young voters overwhelmingly saying, no, I actually think government can be a force for good. I don't inherently see it as this inefficient, wasteful, bad thing. And so the millennials began running, or pardon me, Republicans began running into was not just that they were on the wrong side of many social issues or cultural issues from where young people were at, which that's the kind of thing where I can see that generationally, you know, what, again, what's considered progressive today might be considered conservative 30 years from now. So that is a, a shifting thing. But these questions of size and scope of government, free markets, those are all things where I think it's just failed to have any kind of argument. And therefore, young voters said, well, hey, maybe free markets aren't that great. Um, and so I think it's got to take conservatives figuring out how to leverage free markets and talk about limited government as a way to open and expand opportunity. Um, and it can't just be the way we talked about it in the 1980s with Reagan, because the government is smaller in some ways. It's bigger than others, but the, it's, the problems are not the same as they were in the 1980s. So for me, that's what I sort of see as a, a potential way forward for a Republican candidate who wants to be entrepreneurial, is to talk a little bit more about how the things conservatives believe not just in numbers and nuts and bolts, but in terms of improving people's lives and opening doors of opportunity, uh, is th th that's, a, that's the message for a Republican that wants to have the way forward, that they can talk about why the things they believe create more out uh, caring outcomes, create fairer outcomes. We have to be able to talk in that language and can't just talk about tradition um, and ideology. Tara, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, sure. And I'll keep it short. I think, and we saw a lot of this in the Democratic primary with the incredibly diverse and, and exciting bench of candidates that we had on the left and sort of, again, zooming out and thinking longer term beyond this election, which I do believe will be an outlier in certain ways in terms of how votes are cast. Um, and for who is a referendum on President Trump, knock on wood for my uh, my party and purposes, but I really do believe that, um, that voters increasingly, and especially these younger cohorts that are going to become the largest and already are biggest uh, sort of coalition in the electorate are looking for candidates and elected officials who understand the problems of today um, that our generations are facing when it comes to um, uh, creating a, 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 a new kind of workforce that really meets the challenges in technological innovation um, and, and everything in this country, as well as the challenges of climate change. They want solutions and they want innovative solutions. And they really do, I believe, want, um, want people who have the courage of their convictions and the will and the spine to really take on these really big problems. And that means, of course, voting, I, I think that we are going to see a movement in the center on both sides in certain ways to actually get things done. We have been um, through so many years now of gridlock and the inability to actually meet the challenges of this moment um, from, from our government's perspective and from leadership. And I really do think that the majority of voters, especially young, younger coalitions, want to see things get done. And they're going to have a very high bar for what kinds of solutions are presented and then are, are, are negotiated and debated and, and pushed forward into real policy change. Great. Uh, as I said, we're turning to your questions now uh, with the uh, YouTube chat function or Twitter with the hashtag BPC Live. Um, let's start with a question from Jose T. He's uh, on Twitter. Uh, and essentially his question really is about uh, Trump and the Trump party and, and how perhaps Trump is an outlier. Uh, and you know, one way of thinking about this is we, we talked about a lot of these generations, both of you mentioned it, general shield changes in the 2012 election, Republicans thinking one way and arguably Trump moving in a totally different direction uh, 
uh, and finding a winning coalition that way. So what what do we think about Trump uh, in regard to this generational change? He, mm. he, at least until this election, wasn't until the, the Biden-Trump matchup, wasn't doing very well with young voters, but uh, the, you know, the Biden now potentially doing well with older voters. You know, what do we think about, if not Trump, Trumpism and the future of the demographic change in, in these generations? I'll, I'll take a first stab there. <clears throat> and it's always just a point of clarification, John. Um, so all the simulations, just so everyone knows that you're seeing today, uh, they're all based actually on the 2016 election, where I, I would be perfectly in agreement, I think, with the, with the commenter and the questioner that um, 2020 might be a bad baseline to think about using for the future forever because it is such an extraordinary and, and unusual election relative to even 2016. But 2016, uh, for all the changes that we talked about, actually didn't look all that different, right? There was a, there was a shift in the educational uh, divide among white Americans that was notable, and it was a notable increase in the differences between them. But otherwise, a lot of the voting behavior of a lot of Americans looked relatively similar to as it had in the past. They look like a continuation of trends. So I, I, think, I, I think you're absolutely right that 2020 would be a bad trend, that we wouldn't expect necessarily this, the particular dynamics of this going forward into the future. Um, but 2016, which all this is based on, still strikes me as a, as a pretty decent baseline. Anybody else want to take on Trump as an outlier? I mean, I would just very briefly to, just to say. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Kristen. Go ahead. Uh, why don't you start? Uh, All I'll say Tara, is if, it, if Donald Trump, whether he wins or loses the election, uh, and by how much may have a big effect on that. If Donald Trump loses by a little, I think there's gonna be a lot of discussion that, well, he's the last one to have won as a Republican running for president in quite some time, even though he lost this time, it was a weird election. And you'll still see a, a lot of Trumpism outlast Trump himself in the party. I think if he loses by a lot though, you could see, you know, I believe in politics, everyone loves a winner. And whenever someone loses, people sort of want to keep their distance. Uh, Trump, I think, is has a unique hold on the party. I don't think he will go away. Um, but I think if he loses a little versus loses a lot, has a, a lot to say about whether Trumpism will be a factor in the party long term. Sarah? Sure. So whether um, he started as an outlier from the party or not, and it, he arguably did, the party has wrapped their arms around Trump um, and Trumpism. And, and, and we really haven't seen very many uh, leaders in the Republican Party uh, distance themselves at all uh, from Trump or his policies or approach to um, issues and problems in the electorate. And so I really do believe that uh, regardless of how, um, how, how thin the margins are between a win and a loss in this election. And uh, again, we don't know how this is going to go. Truly, it's been such an unprecedented election. Um, I really do believe that it's going to take much longer than this election for the Republican Party to um, to reassert itself as a party that can be trusted um, to actually approach problems with real solutions um, and, and be willing to to work across the aisle to get those solutions passed into law. Um, I really just think that, that they have doubled down in a way that this could have very, very long term impacts uh, that are accelerated or or, or uh, made even worse by, of course, the demographic shifts that we're seeing tend to favor Democrats. Great. So uh, we have another question coming in from, uh, from Twitter from Jolene McNeil, and she asks where we will see greater electoral shifts, rural, suburban, or urban, urban areas. Um, let me add to that just a little bit. I guess if any of you want to comment on the sort of breakdown of, of progressive opinion in the younger generations. Some of it obviously comes from uh, the demographic makeup of the, those generations, it's much more diverse. But what about some of the subgroups? What about white voters in the younger uh, group? What about white non-college voters? What do we see, how do they compare to, to people of older generations of the same demographic? I can, Bob, I can go ahead and that? chime in. All right, Tara. 
No, sure. So I, I was just going to note that we're already seeing these shifts. So in, um, I, I think it's, uh, it's people often, um, uh, pundits and pollsters and, and folks uh, tend to think about um, suburban uh, areas as predominantly white. The demographics are shifting in our suburbs. Our suburbs are increasingly diverse, especially in a number of the battleground states. And so that obviously impacts um, the electorate as well. And so I think that we're going to continue to see that. Um, there's When it comes to education, that was obviously a very big, um, uh, that was a, that played a very big factor in terms of uh, Republican votes versus Democratic votes in 2016. I think we'll continue to see that. But again, as this study uh, demonstrates, we're going to start to see more uh, white and non-white college educated voters that tend to leave, lean progressive. And I think that that is going to, uh, to shake up the rural versus urban versus suburban um, landscape. I also think that we're gonna continue to see a movement away from urban um, urban areas, especially as we already are with the impact of this pandemic. Um, and, and, that will, and that will shake up suburban um, areas as well. Um, uh, rural, I, I, I'll, I'll leave others to speak to that, but I, I do think that, um, that that continues to tend more conservative. Yeah, and I'll just add a, a single note there, especially from the demographic angle of things. Uh, I think which is just to say that a lot of it's going to depend on internal migration, at least from a get demographic perspective, right, what the report focuses on. We're doing these state level projections, which are already pretty dicey, pretty difficult to do. Um, but one of the things we don't do is start to say, well, are people going to live in cities? Are they going to live in this part of state or that part of the state? And those types of things, depending on how newer generations of Americans decide to live, depending on how newer waves of immigrants, as well as their children decide to live and where they're living in the United States, this could have a really big impact in how this plays out, particularly in the house. Uh, you know, if we wanna think about, um, you know, all the, all the effects right now that the rural urban divide has on representation in the house, um, you know, how that'll continue to play out in the future will have a lot to do with how people choose to live. And to be frank, I, you know, I think there's some trends that we can see today, but it's also very difficult to know. Um, you know, one of the things we never take into account in our projections is the Martian invasion of 2032, right? There's, there's just stuff about the future that we don't know, and that's very, very hard to know. Um, so I think we always have to leave that window open for just the unexpected. You heard it here first about 2032. Okay. Um, oh, I, actually, I, I want to. I, 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 I slipped. I let it slip. I'm so sorry. <laughs> follow up with a question um, of my own. Actually, it follows on the earlier. Uh, the role of religion. Um, we have uh, seeing less uh, people with uh, less religious uh, practice. Uh, people who say they don't believe in religion, or, or people who are. Um, very serious religion, less represented in those younger generations. Um, what's the younger generations look like in that? How much of the, the change that we're talking about is really can be attributed to uh, a different set of religious beliefs in the younger generations than the older ones? I'll take that one. And then I, I definitely want to hear uh, Rob on this one, because I know this is a big a focus of study that, you, that you've done. Yeah, I think it, it plays a pretty significant role in what's interesting about it is that for many young people, they're not actually less likely to say that are themselves people of faith or significantly less likely to do things like pray daily um, or feel a, a connection to a higher power. But it's the sort of practice of organized religion and the labels that younger voters uh, in particular tend to reject. And so this is yet another one I would throw onto the pile of, you know, when people say, ah, younger voters, they're going to get married and have kids and buy homes and do all of these things. Um, they're going to become more conservative. I think religion is a big piece of this. And as you know, if the Republican coalition, if Republicans tend to do quite well with voters who are uh, who do attend religious services frequently, um, it's a, a whiter, older, more married coalition. And we know that that the religious piece is yet another one of those things that future generations just don't look like as much. I just think it's yet another. Uh, it's another gust of wind in, in this, this sort of pushing the tides here to make it harder and harder for Republicans to win in the future if they maintain the same sort of message and policy positions and coalition that they do, that they have now. Yeah, and my, my addition to that, and I think Kristen calls out the right uh, caveats here, right, is that you do have these younger generations who still might express faith or belief in a higher power, but aren't necessarily doing that with an organized religion. And the important thing to keep in mind is that religious communities are a part of political socialization. 
they act as places where people form identities and they form attachments to different values and different political parties at some level. So to the extent that these generations are less attached to these things, it, it just means that there's the potential for them to have sort of less of an effect. So they have, they have played a conservatizing role, particularly among Wiccans, uh, over the past, let's say, 30 years. This is, again, as Kristen noted, another headwind that just might have less of an effect. I think the thing I would add on to this, just again, to think about this generationally and demographically, is that um, one of the clearest identifiers of whether you as an adult might be religious is whether you were raised in a religious household. So, and particularly not just in a religious household, but a religious household where both parents are religious. So if you have higher numbers of people who are not attached to organized religion over time, getting married, going forward into the future, having children themselves, those children themselves are also less likely to be attached to religion. Now, this doesn't work in the same way uh, as demographic change necessarily, right? So religious identification can be picked up later in life. People can choose uh, to become religious um, and, and to be part of a faith community. Um, but some of the demographic forces that are at play here would suggest something uh, of a spiral, something that would just lead to greater and greater levels of secularism or a detachment at the very least from organized religion. So let me um, let me move to another question. If Tara wants to jump in on the religion question, I'll, I'll pose this to you. You can, you can do both if you want. Uh, but this is from Tim Schultz, and he really asks about, you know, I would call it almost the generational economic war. He asks about the politics of economic scarcity. Uh, more and more of our budget going to uh, programs that support older citizens, Social Security, Medicare, uh, and being supported by younger voters who are a smaller part of the, of the pyramid and perhaps a higher burden. What do we know and think about um, attitudes towards this? I, I will note also that arguably the older generation is less um, enthusiastic about government, even though they may be receiving government benefits and the, the younger generation may be more enthusiastic and they're not receiving those. So what do we know about this generational economic scarcity war that, that uh, Tim Schultz is referring to? I think this is such an important topic in question, and I, I, I won't have any, um, any brilliant sort of insights here outside of the fact that I do think that younger generations, um, and Kristen mentioned a data point on this, they, they, they do see government as, um, a, 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 as having the potential to be a force for good, et cetera. I also, as we've seen in the Democratic Party, um, a pretty uh, rapid movement towards um, support for things like uh, Medicare for all, and, um, and a public option when it comes to healthcare. And so I think because we haven't really been seeing um, our government and our policies meet the crises of this moment um, in being able to take care of our own as a country and with the increasing um, income uh, uh, inequality and disparity um, between the wealthiest individuals in this country and everybody else, um, I do think that there is going to be, again, just a, a, a hunger for, a demand for politicians that are willing to take on these very, very, very big challenges um, and come up with big solutions. I think that's why candidates like um, uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, as well as Andrew Yang, um, gained so much popularity in, in the Democratic Party and, and larger coalition is because people are really, really hungry for, for bold change and bold solutions because they know that the current system and the current economy is not working for the majority of Americans. So I do think that is going to continue to play a, a real role. And I, I think it's going to look so different than our our, our economic solutions and policies have looked in the past because of, of, of how badly we've let this go and for how long. Kristen, do you want to say more that you said something about it before? Sure. Do you want to weigh in here? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, one of the things that uh, I recall from the 2012 election, this was right around when I was first starting to study this issue. And you'll recall that Mitt Romney picked uh, a young congressman from Wisconsin named Paul Ryan to be his running mate. And I got asked a ton all of a sudden about, well, you know, Paul Ryan's talked a lot about entitlement reform and he listens to Metallica. And so won't those two things make you popular with young voters? <laughs> and I thought, I'm not sure on either of those fronts. I don't have any data about the, the Metallica piece, but I, I do know that uh, it, it fascinates me. Anytime I've seen any polling data about young voters, on the one hand, they're pretty convinced that they're never going to see a dime of Social Security and Medicare. On the other hand, they're not interested in seeing big cuts to those programs that might affect their parents or grandparents because they know in the end, if their parents need to be taken care of in old age, that that burden is gonna to fall to them. You now see, especially with Gen Xers, this kind of sandwich 
uh, mom philosophy or uh, pardon me, phenomenon, which is essentially where you've got uh, women who are now in their 40s who are raising young children, but they also are taking care of their own parents who are seniors and need help. So I, I think that the idea that there was going to be some kind of generational warfare over entitlement programs, I've just never seen it borne out. Young voters, on the one hand, know that these programs are not sustainable over the long term and, and need change, but at the same time are not angry at their parents or grandparents' generation and, and feel like there's been a sense of, of theft. I just, I have not seen it in data. Great, uh, and I will note that Metallica are all members of AARP at this point, so that might complicate the question as well. Um, <laughs> we have time for one last question, and a couple of people asked this, uh, Sanda Balaban, as well as um, uh, Carolyn Cooper, about voter engagement, uh, voter uh, youth voter engagement. And we know typically younger voters vote at a lower rate, and we've built some of those into the models of, of the report. Uh, Tara, you were you were pretty optimistic that young people are going to vote at, at higher rates this time. We saw a pretty good turnout in the midterm elections. Um, what do we have to say about uh, young people voting, the relative side of that, and and whether that's sustainable uh, or if it's or if it's kind of a, a one time election this time? Yeah, it's it's a really great question. And so we did more more people between the ages of 18 and 34 voted in the uh, 2018 midterm election than ever had before in a midterm since the age uh, I lowered to 18 years old um, for eligibility to vote. And I, I do expect that we're going to see records broken again um, by younger voters in this election. We already have seen that more millions and millions more young people have already voted, cast their ballots in this presidential election than ever before at this state at this point in time um and 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 i mentioned this earlier but voting behavior um is really influenced by when you start voting when you start participating in elections um as soon as you as early as you do vote for the first time um and when you vote for the first time you are so much more likely to vote again and again so the more young people that we were bringing we are bringing in to the voting electorate or trump i should say maybe bringing in to this electorate one way or another um will have uh, significant, um, uh, it, it will it will absolutely influence how how young our electorate is and the voting rights of young people. By how much, it's uh, very very to be determined. But I think that we will. I don't believe that it will uh, just be this election. I do worry that we need to double down and make sure that everybody that is enthusiastically voting in this election understands that the stakes are equally as high to be able to maintain the House in 2022 because we know the pendulum swing uh, after after a presidential election is real, especially when it comes to um, a party swing. So I, I think that it's just gonna require also a difference in how we continue to talk to voters year round and not just within presidential election cycles which is a necessary shift for both parties. Kristen, you get the last word of the, of the event, short word on that subject. I think we can expect very high youth vote turnout. The fact that it was so high in the last midterm is a sign to me that we're gonna see a ton of young people coming out because if you're a midterm voter, that almost certainly are a presidential election voter. Um, so I'm, my expectations are that young people are going to vote. Voting is a habit forming behavior. The first time you tend to keep doing it for the long haul. Um, but it's up to all of us to encourage that high level of civic participation that I expect to see. Great. Thank you, Kristen Soltis Anderson. Thank you, Tara McGowan. Uh, thanks to all of our partners, including Rob Griffin, Bill Fry, Rudy Teixeira couldn't join us. Uh, and finally, thank you to our audience. Uh, important event leading up to our election and thinking about our future. We're going to close. Uh, thank you again.